We do all kinds of things here at Word in Your Ear. Video casts like this. Podcasts like this. Crowdcast events with famous authors. Live quizzes. And we can guarantee to make your next birthday one you'll never forget. There's only one way to guarantee getting all of this, to getting it before anybody else, and that's to sign on to be a supporter on Patreon. Full details at this address. Word in your attic. A Zoom with a view. Okay, welcome back. Another Word in your attic. We're delighted to be joined by comedian writer man about time simon day simon nice to see you great to good see you morning. great to see you hello how are you yeah we're where, good where, how are you and where are you is it it's london right i'm in london i'm in northwest london wilsdon or cricklewood or uh you know wherever you want to call it depending on um wilsdon let's call it wilsdon right i'm wilsdon. equidistant from dollis hill station and from okay. uh Wills and Green Station, as my dad would say, equidistant words like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how have you, have you been dealing with the last year? Well, I've had a strangely good year. I, I, it's not been that bad. I mean, the first lockdown was in the summer, wasn't it? And 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 we just got a puppy, and the kids were sort of okay about it. Um, and it was it wasn't too bad. I mean, I I I just got a bit of working under the wire literally we did a fast show 25 years thing and we got paid for that and i could do a little bit of something else so financially it was okay you know i don't really do stand up anymore i would do bits and bobs and then uh, and then we've i've been filming this american thing on and off which closed down and then they started it up again uh, which, which is called pennyworth which is one of these things origin stories don't get me started it's about batman's it's about Batman's butler when he's young and he's come out. Of oh, God. Well, that, I mean, that really that, is that really they is. They really rinse it, don't they? I'm saying milking it. I'm trying not to <laughs> say milk. milking it, but that's a Batman's but, butler's backstory. <laughs> and it's like it's massive. It's huge, you know. And it's like it, the guy it, wrote Rome and he wrote something else. It's it's filmed up the road from me at the Harry Potter studios, and I do the odd I play a, a, a landlord of a pub, you know, and it, I. I did the video. I did it. I did it. I, I, I never get these things. You do the things on, on phones now and you do the, you do the, the, the reading and you go, oh, right, you do the landlord, forgot about it. Two months later, they said, oh, they've got it. And hang on, it's a season because it's American. I do the odd day. And, and, and again, it keeps me going, you know. So, I, it, you know, it's been okay. And I'm, I, you know, God bless everyone. No one I know has actually passed away from this disease. My dad's in, sure. in, in a, and care but he's okay and my stepfather's okay and you know uh i've sort of been all right i mean actors don't do anything anyway just lie about don't we so it's no different for us really. <laughs> well apart from david tennant and michael sheen who've absolutely nailed it i think have you been watching stage yeah, I, I haven't seen that no i must watch oh that. it's terrific is it good yeah i've heard it's good there's so much content now though it's impossible isn't it to yeah keep up with it well it's a good job there is i mean if this yeah a- if this had happened before this, in the days of three TV yeah, okay. channels, yeah. whatever, yeah. just bear thinking about, does it really? Plus, softly, softly again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it's getting to that already. The BBC are mining back, aren't they? The, um... Well, no, but every single comedian and p- performer is contacting the BBC and saying, why don't you show my series that I did in 1986? Why don't you show Pern again? Why don't you show this? Why, you know, well, they're all doing it. But apparently they've got enough stuff till July. This is what I've heard. They've got enough stuff till July. And then they've got to uh, find some stuff from somewhere else. <laughs> but, but you know, things are being made. People are working now. You know, I, I'm, yeah. I'm work. I'm gonna. I'm gonna be working in a month on something. You know, it's not. It's not. It's not. But well, it's not essential. It's it, there's lots of grey areas with this COVID. Yeah, well, yeah. films. Yeah. I know this because my son-in-law works in the film business, and um, and film workers have kind of key worker status, don't they? Oddly yeah. enough, you know, because it's it makes a lot of money, uh, and, and the biggest yeah. apparently the biggest earner is. Is films in the UK. So Charlie Hickson uh, told me it was one of the biggest earnings the government getting yeah, paid. American yeah. films make films, in, but obviously they're not doing. It. Who knows? Right. Um, so yeah. you've got have you got kids? Are you involved in homeschooling or? Yes, very reluctantly. I've got a daughter and a son. They've just become teenagers, and the, you know they've changed. They've they've gone from being just they just completely uninterested in me. Uh, they're in their rooms on their phones. They don't want to eat anything. Yeah, what do you want? Classic. Uh, you know, <laughs> that's absolutely uh, classic. Corn yeah. flakes in the middle of the night. Every yeah, day. wandering Lord. around in the box of shorts. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, exactly. I'm on a call. I'm on a call. Yeah. You go yeah. in there. They're like businessmen. You go in there. Go. I'm on a call. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on a call. <laughs> I'm on a call. 
<laughs> yeah. I think yeah. They're, I, I, they're not yet at that stage that Mark and I often recall fondly, where you only know that they're in the house by the presence of cereal bowls left yeah, on chair no, arms. Not yet, but yeah. <laughs> we haven't said you treat this house like a hotel yet. Um, <laughs> I, remember being, I remember being in a meeting once uh, on a, a magazine with various kind of fairly high profile people and my phone went. I thought, I should better just take this. And it was my, my teenage son. He said, Dad, he said, I'm in the kitchen, I've opened the fridge and there's no food. And you know, you're, you're going, there's loads of food. Sorry about this. Yeah, There's loads yeah, of food. Yeah. Said, there's no food I like. <laughs> I thought that is absolutely classic. You know? I know. <laughs> what but, can you do? Exactly. But the thing now is, is they go, oh, is it all right if I get a bubble tea on Deliveroo? You know, <laughs> one cup of tea. It's like costs eight quid, the whole thing. What? The a, planet. a cup I'm of like, tea delivered? Yes, a bubble tea. This is my daughter. And we just said, no. Well, rather than go down the kitchen and make one? No, bubble tea is this, this new, it's a new um, sort of phase. Uh, they've got bubble tea places and you get these semolina pods in it. It's Japanese or something. Oh, right, okay. It's all around London. You can't really get it. Uh, you know, you can't really make it yourself. It's a bit like a Big Mac. You see what I mean? And so oh, yeah. the deliverer, of course, will deliver it to you on a bike. Uh, if you want it. But that's the thing. You've got to try and stop all that because they are remotely living their lives, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but again, you go, you've got to stop buying stuff on, you know, Amazon as your you two, you know, Joshua Tree, 25 year thing arrives, box set, <laughs> in five, five different formats. There's nothing to see which, here. That's right. Four of which you haven't got. And then you, you go, hang on, did I buy that two years ago? That's the worry when you buy things yeah, yeah. twice. God. Absolutely. So have so, you got some old stuff you've been uh, digging out the attic or anything? Okay, well, I, I'm a bit of a sort of... I don't really hang on to stuff. I'm going to... The first, I've got some absolute gold. Here is my band. Oh, oh wonderful. That's me God. singing. That's you in the in the what? In the white shirt? Yeah. White shirt. And there's uh, a guitar, guitarist there, so he's reflecting, and the bass player. We were all 16. What That's were you called? Oh, God. The, the name was terrible. We were called Simon and the Virgins. That's not great, actually. No. But, uh, you know, <laughs> we grew up in Blackheath. And so we were very lucky because our local band was Squeeze. Yeah. We would go, you know, we, everyone went to see it. Well, go down the pub and Squeeze would be on. So we were kind of spoiled. And everyone was in bands and I wanted to be in bands. That's all everyone did. No one wanted to be a comedian. They just wanted to be in bands. And so... Yeah, we started up, and, and the odd the odd thing is, is that all the other three went on to do really sort of well in the industry. Sadly, Nigel, the drum, the drummer, he was a brilliant drummer. He was in uh, Sudden Death Cult, and he played with the Cult, and he died sort of very young. Uh, I mean, it's a bit sort of final chat, but he was just brilliant drummer. And Seamus played with loads of people, Madness, Paul Weller. You know, I used to sit in before I started doing comedy. I used to sit in pubs and go, "Yeah, I used to be in a band, you know." That's right. They've all made it, and I, 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 I literally they would go, "Oh, right." And the other guy, Ben, he played with loads of people. You know, he was a bass player, and then he basically started selling badges and ended up being the sole person who runs Carhartt, and is now in England and is now a sort of millionaire. So, oh, good grief! It is. God, yeah, incredible, almighty. isn't it? Can but you yeah, remember I was, any of the I was, song? You know, I, I, I was. We did Stepping Stone, of course, and we wrote a few yeah. songs. I wrote the song, the lyrics. Well, can you remember any song titles? Yes. Oh, tube Train. Oh, that Tube Train. Why do I always have to take the pain? Uh, I remember <laughs> the line from it. Um, <laughs> you're, you're the one, you know, you're the only one for me or whatever. But I do, you know, it was very, you know, I loved music. I was obsessed with music. And uh, I, my, my brother, you know, I lived in Blackheath and my Blackheath Records, I saw Danny Baker knows, knows the shop well. And... My brother started buying records sort of very anally, um, sort of uh, very young. He was one year older than me. And I, I would come back with a single and he'd have bought it on four different colour vinyls. So I just stopped buying records. He then went on to become a DJ and he's got, he DJed at Shume and all the early Acid House clubs then just gave it up and said I want and got a proper job. Um, so I, but I love, you know, I love music and bands. But because he was sort of, I would always, because I didn't want to be like him, like he loved T Rex. So I like Slade, you know, you don't want to be the, the guy that copies your brother. And, I, I, and I'm glad I chose Slade, you know. Uh, I loved Slade. Can you uh, remember the first record you bought? First single? Yes, I can. Look that. I, I remember that. I was, you know, I wanted to th think of a cool one, but it was, it was Melanie. And I've got a brand. Uh, wow. Yeah. I I prefer those choices because they're real. 
It's when people 10. tell me the first record they ever bought was Anarchy in the UK. I think, I no, I don't believe Yeah, exactly. It was, it was, it was Captain Benny Captain Beefheart, Hill. that's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 That's in the I know. labels. They go, yeah, exactly. all... that, that's the, you sort of think, what can I say? And you go, oh, yeah, it was Captain Beefheart. But no, it yeah. was, it was, I've, I loved that. And I remember um, buying that and, and playing it. And we had, a, we had one of the old record players with a chichung. And I remember my brother buying a load of records without middles off some guy in the street. And I remember he had Dizzy and lots of rock and roll records, obviously. All right, right. Um, but then I, then my dad bought the Bang & Olufsen system, which never oh, worked. Really? Oh, really? Like, my brother <laughs> reminded me of this. It broke. It never worked. And every time we mentioned it, he'd go, be quiet. <laughs> it, it, just, it, it was like really expensive. But I remember I then bought when I was... 70, when I was 15, what I went and bought, I got it was $4.99. I bought physical graffiti on cassette uh, from Blackie right. Records. I was over the moon with it. And I went down to we went down to Devon on a family holiday and I won those little Philips cassette players that went eh, eh, with the plastic case, you know, and play with a sort of oh the portables. Yeah, the little one. Battery operated. I have one of those. And yeah. the little the little top came off and divided into two stereo speakers. Up, it pressed play. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you forward, clicked it. it back and it clicked off yeah. at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just I love that album. I, I I just thought that was such a brilliant album. Um so, the, so this is without headphones, presumably, is how yeah, I would just sit and listen to it in Devon on a rock or in the barn or, or you know. <laughs> It, it was it was just great, and I just it I, I really it can't have that. been brilliant sound. <laughs> no, the sound oh, no, they were terrible. They had no bass at all. Little no, tiny no little plastic speakers about this big, and Probably. you put them either side of you for a stereo effect. I love the idea you're on, Ash, you're on a rock Ash, or a yeah. cashmere. <laughs> cashmere, <laughs> that's right. A bit tinny. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I went to see bands, and of course we were sort of squeeze all the time. And then you know that's you know, and I, I was very lucky to see Doctor Feelgood about four times. Um, you know, that would be probably, you know, I saw them with Mink DeVille. Uh, I was never a punk. I wanted to be a punk, but I could never fully. It's like everyone goes, oh, I was a punk. Well, I wasn't a punk. I didn't have the guts to do it. And I remember I went to see, I went to see uh, 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 Johnny Rotten. No, uh, what are they called? Dr. Feelgood and Eddie and the Hot Rods and Mink DeVille. Oh, and Rainbow, I think it was. And I had 15 whole Dr. Martins painted pink. White skin tight white cricket trousers, a white shirt with 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 safety pins, and a basin haircut. I'm not exaggerating. I had a basin haircut, <laughs> and I went in there, and immediately this bloke named Fred Perry came up and said, "You're looking at me, mate." It was the second I walked in, but I looked like a Morris dancer who'd been shredding grapes, you know. And but you don't know when you're young how lucky you are to see. I mean, Doctor Fugel was so odd, weren't they? They were just terrifying. But they, I was just stare at them and go, "What are they about?" They were just like from another world, you know. But they were so good and so. They, was it? Who was it? Was it Mick Farron in the Enemy who um, memorably described Doctor Feelgood as looking as though they'd come together in some particularly unsavoury part of the British Army? <laughs> <laughs> Which I was a, That's absolutely good. terrific. That's they, good. They, I, I, I the remember white seeing suit them. used to get so grubby by the end of the show. But he, yeah. he was the. He, it was that their confidence to stand there and be something that they weren't really. You know what I mean? Right. They were they were just yeah. a bunch of guys who formed a band. And yeah. Wilco was kind of former hippie and done the Indian yeah. the trail to India and all this. But they just transformed themselves into these creatures that just looked utterly strange and absolutely gripping on stage, weren't they? Yeah, I think because it was it was such an act, even though it had no props or anything no. like that to it, you know. I mean, I think a big influence on Paul Weller as well, obviously. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Or did anybody. Wilco, did Wilco machine gun you with his guitar? Yeah, he did all that. And I remember he left just after that, and we went back to see them. And Seamus, who was in the band, he made a little bag saying, where's Wilco? Because he came from a sort of arty family. But, right. yeah, I just... We, and the Albany, the Albany Empire in Deptford was our local place, and they oh, had right. bands there all the time. I just yeah. used to go and see everyone. I saw Shaq, you know, I used to go to Jar Shaq or whoever was on. I go and see Missy and Roots. You know, that was it. And and Shard, I remember in the eighties they, they they moved there, and I saw New Order and Shard and it was it, you just saw bands, didn't you? You weren't particularly impressed by some of them. Some were good, some were bad. But then there was, but the punk thing was more, you know, all that sweat and beer. It was more. But what was it? What was that? That, that music? They, they, they sort of Baker Girl. What was that uh, genre of music called? Pub rock. Right, right. You know what I mean? But I used to just yeah. get drunk and sort of jump about. You know, I never really, 
my, but I also was one of the people that didn't that missed out. I, I would often just not go to things. I, I wanted to do a chapter in my book about all the things I didn't go to because I kind of always being a comedian and sort of lived in my head, but I was that sort of weird kid. So I remember once my brother said, you come, we've got a ticket. Do you want to come and see a kid? I said, who is it? He said, oh, it's the, the, this was sort of when I was really, I think I was, my parents had broken up or something. It was Jam, The Clash. And I went, no, it's all right. I'm washing my hair. And I literally was washing my hair. So I missed out on a few gigs as well. <laughs> I wasn't one of these people that saw everyone and saw everything with all, like it's like we listen it's to not Robert classic Elms. stuff for an autobiography, is it? <laughs> no, you listen exactly. You listen to Robert Elms, and he he was everywhere. He was, yeah. he was on the sound, the you know the rainbow when Bob Marley was there. He was at that. I, I, I'm the opposite to that. I'm kind of yeah. I'm a suburban kid. I did a lot of staying in and hanging about and wondering what I was going to do. And I ended up being a comedian. Thank thank God because I don't think I could do anything else. But it's just interesting. All the comedians I know, and when I first met Jim and Bob and and Paul White, we were all much more obsessed with music than sort of comedy. Well, we did our comedy. You know, when we were on the tour with Jim and Bob, we just talked about music, you know. And, and you know, they were obsessed with free and I would play them stuff. And I've had enough of this bloody Staley done. Jim would always say, I get it now, but I've had enough of it. Um, they just played free all the time. They were obsessed with free. And, and, and why not, you know? Well, free were always a very big thing in the northeast of England, were they? Free, free became successful in the northeast of England. If you go and listen to Free Live, I think it's recorded in Sunderland, isn't it? Right. That okay, was always that. where their heartland was. I don't know if they came from there. Did Paul? Did uh, Paul did Rogers he, is a Geordie? Paul, isn't it? Paul, Paul Kossoff Rogers, is yeah. a Southerner, though, isn't he? Paul Ross, uh, Kossoff is a Londoner. Ross lived. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, David Kossoff's son. Yeah. 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 Uh, so what, your band, how serious were you in your band? Did you ever entertain? Well, you know, the idea uh, we, we were very, you know, we, we were very lucky. We sort of supported, we supported a few people. We supported stuff at the Albany. We, we went to, there was a Crossfields Festival, which anyone could get on, which very famously, Dire Straits would always the headline. And I remember being there one year and they didn't turn up. And someone went, they've gone gold in Australia. Some bloke came in or something. And then no one ever saw them again. And it was like, the well, that's straight, they're going to be famous. You know what I mean? It's so weird, isn't it? It's like, they just have an old pub band. We see them down a pub, you know, and suddenly they're like the biggest band in the world. Are you, and and uh, it's weird, isn't it? Who, who becomes famous and who isn't? It? You can't really predict. Ab absolutely. Absolutely. Who did you support there? Can you remember? Anybody? Did, did uh, you ever support yeah, them? The Convent Nuns were on and we supported. Oh, that's, listen, I'm forgetting the Red Lights. It was a group called the Red Lights. They were the big group below Squeeze. They never nearly got signed. Scottish singer Ashley Cadell, they were really good and they played proper music and they were a really good band, but it kind of never really happened. Um, I, my, I was, you know, I was kind of wayward even at that stage and it didn't really sort of happen. I didn't rehearse and blah. I was, what, 15, 16? My parents broke up. My life kind of went bang. I was in squats and trying to cope with the addiction issues and fruit. So I didn't really... I knuckled down, do you know what I mean? And so then they they said, look, we're, we're you know, you're never here. And it's so weird to think they were saying that when I was 15 and 16. And I, and I remember thinking at the time, there's no point learning guitar, I'm too old. You know, when I was 16, it's <laughs> like- 16? <laughs> yeah, it's just bizarre, isn't it? I just, it, that, that, I kind of, yeah, I was in a bit of a sort of, you know, what they call a dark place now. I had issues at that point. So I couldn't really focus on a lot. And I, and I did a lot of drinking and just living, really, you know, being a teenager around and about. But uh, music so what was your first all... experience of comedy? Comedy, first experience of comedy, we watched watching it with my dad and, you know, on telly. And my dad had a massive book collection. He, he, uh, and he had a thing called A Century of Punch. And he liked oh, the right. goons. And I, and I loved, and, I, and I, it's funny, because I've done this interview so many times about the fire show, I'm finally saying it. Where's you, what's your first influence? My first influence was Punch and those cartoons and all those characters, the Englishness, and the, they're so brilliant, some of those cartoonists. Yeah, yeah. Even the Victorian ones, Osbert Lancaster and Bateman and all those people and, and the way they just summed up people in a photo and, and it, 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 a tiny etching, you know. It's true because uh, the, uh, the older Punch was incredibly good, incredibly yeah. radical and political. I think it's been ruined by everyone's memory of the very last episode of Punch, which is all just yeah. jokes about kind of bosses and secretaries. And there's always a picture yeah. of one single frame of a bloke mowing a lawn with a kind of angry wife, you know. And actually, it was much, much better than that. It was, it was no, really... they had social realism jokes, you know, they had all kinds of stuff. Obviously, the golf section, 
but Bateman's my yeah. favourite. I mean, he he was just really slightly odd. He did these sort of slightly trippy lots of the. He did the famous cricket one with the guy coming out taking the bat, and he's. I'm not going to describe it, but I was obsessed with with cartoons, not those cartoons, not Marvel. And then I just read like a lunatic. I didn't. I was very withdrawn as a kid a lot, and I just read and read and read and read, which is what I did. I I, I was sort of left school at 15. But what were you reading? Anything, but I anything from Biggles to. I would just and I read all. I got very into the whole Ginsburg world and all that stuff. And I very freak brothers. I spent lots of pot and, um, you know what's he called? The bloke shot himself out of a cannon. The Gonzo fell. I was obsessed with Hunter uh, S. Thompson. Yeah, I Hunter S. Thompson. You know, and I was into all that. And funny enough, I watched your <laughs> bloke who shot himself out of a cannon. That's pretty well, I know he did, didn't he? He did. He did. He did. He did. Did he? Or was that his ashes? Was shot it was out his, of I think it was his ashes. I Sorry, think, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's funny Shuffling. how he changed because when I was young, I thought he was a genius, and now I just think, you know, you've got a kid, you're selfish. It's t- you know what I mean? When you have, oh, yeah, yeah. Like, my whole attitude to that whole rock and roll, it's, it's a myth, isn't it? Of like, you know, yeah. live fast, die young. I, I've been watching all the documentaries recently, that brilliant band film, the recent one with Robbie Robertson, one, and it's just so sad. And you just think yet. they were so young and so talented, and they had no idea. Oh, they just t- car crashes and oh, they just miserable lives. down. Oh, you know, all these incredibly wishes. talented young people, and 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 you just think, God, gone, 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 and and he was an addict, so he's all right, and his wife. Oh, and, 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 the, and their whole career is about to take off. I think when yeah. when and they're going to tour the first album when Rick Danko, I think it is, gets completely yeah. distant, crashes a car and breaks his leg or something, and they can't tour. And from that moment, you feel this is just it's going wrong. I know. Really. It's 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 uh. This is sad. Uh, I don't know. I've lost my train of thought of what we're talking about. Uh, comedy, uh, was, yeah. Comedy. I was wondering, Go when on. you first got on a stage and, and told a joke, I mean, you know, because you'd been in the band and that would be yes. one experience of performing. And how did that compare with going on stage and doing stand-up or whatever? Can you remember the first time? Well, you I remember it? when I was in a, ba- in a band and we were sort of getting ready doing a sound check at the Albany and this guy walked past and he sort of looked up. He said, black guy and he went he goes you got stage presence and he walked off and i remember going like sort of shuddering with sort of like joy and thinking i want this you know and uh and uh, you know we did a gig and this girl came up sort of sat very close to me and i was like right okay this is this is you know this is why we're doing it because i'm i'm a weirdo i'm not gonna get girl with any other way which is why and uh when i did comedy uh i'd been you know I, I was then, I started very late, I was what, I was I was 40 and I'd just been living in a council flat and just doing and thinking what you're going to do with your life and blah, blah. And then it was all very lucky, really. And when I first did the first gig, all my friends came who I'd sort of known for years and it was very difficult. But this guy, Mark Swan, basically Jim and Bob, they, they moved to South East London. They started writing uh, in Jules Holland Studio. And my friend had a fireplace shop underneath and he got to know them and he said, you're funny. You should write something. They do, they do a talent night. And I was like, yeah. And I rang him up one night. So I'm going to come down. Well, all right. I didn't go. And then because I'm just, dis- I've got bad dyslexia and ADHD. I can't, this guy became the sort of half man, half desk. And he, he wrote everything down and made me rehearse it. And he was brilliant, Mark. He was so good. And, and he, he got the wigs. And he went, no, do it again. And I did my first set. It was very different to what everything else was doing. And I did Tommy Cockles. And I did America. I did Robert De Niro in Raging Bull. You know, going, hey, you've been eating my sweets and all that. And he, instead of having a go about that, he has a go because she's, you know, I look in the bag there. You've been eating my milky way and my revels and all this. And, and, and then a great punchline he wrote, hey, I could have been a confectioner. And it was just, and they, and they, and Jim and Bob were just pissing themselves. Half, and loads of people were laughing heads off. Some people were silent. And they just went, you're oh, smart. You can come and tour with us. And that's literally what happened. And I did a few gigs and went on tour with them Wonderful. in 1991. So everyone stood up, you know, second summer love. And, and I'd come on in the middle and after they realised I was, wasn't them, they might start booing. But after I did sort of 15 dates of drunk students throwing stuff, I wasn't really scared of anything. And they were really helpful to them. But they went, they don't get it. It goes over their heads. Keep on doing it. So, you know, they were so helpful to me. And I think people forget that about them. They, you know, with Matt Lucas and they're very good at, at, at that stuff. And then Paul and Charlie helped me a lot as well. Um, <laughs> But yeah, a funny, thing, but funny thing about uh, uh, about Vic Reeves 
uh, our old friend Barry McElhenney always said, remembers interviewing him for he applied for a job on Smash Hits. Yeah, probably sure around a, probably around about that time, didn't he? I mean, he was just one of those one-off people. He was like he's like a. Yeah, everyone goes. Who's your mind? Who's the, the guy that in the Bonzo Dog Doodah band? Viv He can do anything, Jim. He can make his own costumes. He can paint. He's a genuine English eccentric. And, and you know, I, I got more laughs just listening to them in the tour bus talking about this weird thing. He's got no fear, Jim. You know, he he came to South East London and they set up this gig in this place, this wine bar in Deptford that, where, where people, you know, someone got shot in there. It was a really dangerous. And then go in there and go, oh, right, Mick, would you pass me the piece? People be going... <laughs> Well, that's where on it. They go, you're a shit monkey. And I, literally, people have been sent, like, almost sort of, and, and they go here and say, to your opinion, young man. But they kind of, it kind of deflected everything. You know, he had no, they would just die and die and die. And not, and, and he just, just go, they'd laugh and go, they don't get, you know, they're, they're amazing. That's and incredible it, confidence, it comes, isn't it? To believe that you're right and they're wrong, you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm completely the opposite. And then they'll eventually know. catch up. And that's an amazing gift, isn't it? Yeah, I've not gone the opposite. I'm like, yeah, you're right, I'll go. So yeah. But uh yeah, and 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 it was just <laughs> incredible. So you're on tour with them and all the and we went to Sheffield and the Human League came and all the bands were coming to see us. Famously, he went to see Morrissey, didn't he? And and they and uh he came back and said, Oh, I got really well with him and all that. And then Morrissey wrote in the did this horrible thing the enemy saying Dick Reeves is the sort of person that if he stops speaking, he believes the world will turn into a bowl of dust and said all these horrible things about him. But he didn't care again, you know. Um, he said, Should we go around and see the fella from Prefab Sprub? Come on, because we're up near him and all that. And then we, we did we were gonna go around to his house off the tour bus, you know, and suddenly we got a big list of things, you know, you can't come, you must do this, only one can come. Paddy McAloon. I mean, what a, I mean, cry, there's another genius for you. Uh, talking about great stuff. He looks album. like Leonardo da Vinci, doesn't he? He looks fantastic. Have you seen pictures of him recently? Incredible. He's, he's, is he deaf now? Completely deaf or something? He's lost. Yeah, he's lost he had a smile. hearing problem and uh, produced an amazing record. Um, uh, kind of yeah, orchestral talking about record. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah orchestral. Yeah. Mega how good are the, his songs? I mean, how and, and the, the, the the sonically, the way they sound and everything about. I go back and listen to them the other day, and you think you don't at the time. You go, oh, "It's not a bad record. You're spoiled, aren't you?" And they were just brilliant. I mean, that the you know Bob was obsessed with that. Do, do, do you find during this time that uh, it, that because you probably stopped getting new things that you started appreciating the things you've got, and so you go, have you gone back and listened to any old records that you? And well, I, I you know, I like to try and listen to new stuff because if you stop, you know, you don't hear if you don't go out, you don't hear new music. You know, that was why I was my. Uh, thing but but you know my kids i used to listen to a couple of of sort of garagey uh um radio um radio stations for the kids when they're young you know uh but but um i listen to a lot of the same stuff really i try and listen to different things you know but i listen to a lot of the same stuff i'm sort of going through the Joni mitchell phase at the moment uh i'm sort of obsessed with her and in fact i i did a classic thing i ordered uh, she's just done a big CD, new CD thing, you know, the, the early years. So I ordered it and it didn't come. And I'm sort of, I'm sort of emailing them. And they said, yeah, it's not been printed yet. It was, it was a, anyway, it came and, and it, I don't like that early stuff. I don't like all that. What I love is, is I can't pronounce it. Is it Herajer? Herajera. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and that's my favourite album. Those two. Right. And um, right. the Pissing of Summer Longs. I just think they're right, just yeah. perfection. <laughs> And you I must have gone that. through a major uh, uh, prog stage at, at some point because Brian Byrne, which we can't ask you about, because it's so funny. Came out never, of, did they come out of a I was always for... a Peter Gabriel fan. Yeah. His solo stuff. I never liked Genesis. I never liked Land Lies Down on Broadway and all that. I never got into it. I, was too, I didn't like all the the, ki the keyboards and stuff like that. Odd enough, I like the sort of, I don't like to say I like the Phil Collins stuff, but I, but I like some of it. You know, I like. Um, but I was never really into Pog that much. I mean, I mean obviously, my brother had that Focus album. We, we used to listen to that. But um, I was just obsessed with music and read a lot of music. And I've read a lot of music journalism. I've read a hell of a lot of music biographies. You know, I was, a, I, but I, I'm, you know, and, and I was obsessed. But why did you think it had such comic potential, that whole era? Because it's incredibly well, well, funny. Well, Reese came up with it. Because what Reese said to me, listen, because we both like Peter Gabriel. He likes Genesis, I like Peter Gabriel. And he said... Oh, you've got to see, you've got to see Pete Gabriel. He's been doing these things, uh, uh, these little films, you know, to promote stuff. 
And he obviously, he's so awkward in English. And he's on his films going, hello, I'm here. And there's all scaffolding in the background and sort of 25 different sort of men, you know, doing things. He goes, I'm here in Cologne where we're doing a few shows. He just comes over. So, so he's so not fluent. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And we said, why don't, you know, can you, you can do him. And I do it, you know, because I used to do an impression of him. And he said, why don't, we, why don't we have a go at it, you know, and, and make it like, it's the opposite of Keith Richards because everyone on telly rockers are Keith Richards. You, you know, they don't take drugs. They're, they're, they're sort of very English, very intelligent, and sort of but passionate. You know, and shy and retiring as well. Shy yeah. and retiring. Yeah, we just yeah, took yeah. it from there. You know, it was Reese's idea, really. He drove it, but but um, it was great to do. It didn't really get seen by a lot of people. Um, and then what he the, came. What was the band in. called? Thotch. When they called Thotch. Tried, well, our Thatch was the idea, but they wouldn't let us because that was that was my name, Thatch, but. It apparently, it's another band called Thatch. And <laughs> so, that's a good name. The, the attention to detail was brilliant. There was a Simon Callow character, I think, called Bennett St. John, which is also a very <laughs> prog rock name, but it's really good. I <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I, I, you know, I just love music. I know, and I, I read The Enemy obsessively, and not yeah. The Enemy, to the point where you sort of, it's a bit dangerous, isn't it? Because you get to the point, I remember suddenly hearing Mick Hutton say, your, your paper's full of guilt, you know, you hate people doing well for themselves. And you realise, oh, actually, there's no black music in it. Luckily, my brother was a DJ, and he was playing me all this other stuff, and I was going to the Albany and listening to, de- to music. It's very, that whole sort of enemy world is quite, is, is very sort of enclosed, isn't it? But and then the, the, you've got the melody maker world with sort of Eric Clapton, so, you know, the best guys in the world, sort of winning it every year, and the best drummer. I remember all the, the lists. Who was the best drummer? I don't know. <laughs> In the world, it was just so strange. Yeah, and so I just, I used to just. Well, it was always just the drummer who was in the most popular band, wasn't it? It wasn't necessarily the best yeah, drummer. Yeah, of course. Lester George. Bangs, I've got his stuff. I read him. Uh, I just, yeah, I just like reading. Really, I'm, I'm a bit of a sort of more of a reader than I am a take of a, a, a someone who takes part. You know, that I get right. from my dad. So uh, that that's what saved me with the comedy when I came to do comedy, and the and, and the writing was that uh, was that I'd read so much, I had a good vocabulary. But you know the actual, right. you know what I mean, and 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 well, I think a lot of my, my characters are either sort of there's a bit of my dad in Tommy Cockles, and then and then the others were just people like you know me. And but I think I think what the the one thing out of the life of someone who 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 isn't doesn't fit in, who used to drink a lot and just go to pubs and do our jobs is you're constantly watching and looking at things, you know. Like a lot of lead singers, they go, oh, I couldn't have done anything else, like you know. Um. And, and I was always been fascinated by people, you know, and I always found working class, to use that trait, people more interesting than middle class people. I kind of I found the whole middle class thing slightly. So I would go to, you know, my mates would all be going there. I would just go to a pub and you, I'd be end up with some weird bloke talking to him. You know, I think that's what the strength of the far show is, is that it is the detail of the characters. You know what I mean? It's, um, I was watching one of your clips yesterday the, the the guy in the pub who comes up and tells you how to how to work the fruit, fruit machine yeah 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 and i and that is so recognizable but then i realized i've never seen anybody actually do that ever but somehow it's utterly plausible but that I a guy like that well, would be in a pub machine. and i used to do that i was addicted, this is the thing i was addicted to fruit machines and I was, and when you don't, when you're addicted to fruit machines, you put your money in, then you stare at them, thinking, "Oh, you know," because I had a five, I'd have a beer money, and then you lose it. And my mates would say, "Don't go on the machine." My mates would take me to real ale pubs where there were no machines, so that so that I wouldn't lose my money, and I'd lose it. Oh, yeah, oh no! And then they'd have a go, or, and then and I would go up and say, "That's going to pay out," and it's so that's so I just thought. Right, and then you and then this, you got the punch thing with the four cartoons and the four different. It's the repetition, isn't it? You know, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, Paul, it's Paul and Charlie, really. They, you know the story. They were watching a Harry, a Harry's greatest hits. They got a Harry Oldfield show and they shortened it all. And they went, oh, what is funnier without all the, the shorter it is? Let's do yeah. that. Let's let's just do catchphrase and out. I didn't actually. I didn't know that. So they just edited it down. Yeah, they were editing down a Harry Enfield uh, show. And they watched it, you know, with all the sketches shown. They went, this is funny, the, the, the actual proper sketches. And they said, why don't we do a show of just catchphrase out? And that was their idea, you know. Um, I was lucky to when, get in there, you know. It was just great. When you're developing a, a character, uh, or, you know, which presumably just starts with you kind of ripping yeah. with your friends and so forth, do you wait for a friend to say, I think there could be something in that? Or do you, or do you ever just turn up and go, 
I've I've invented this guy. I think it's really funny. And then run the risk that they're going to go, well, we don't, or whatever. Well, it's, it's you funny to say that, because with the far show, you know, we all did our rehearsals, and Paul and Charlie had written loads of stuff, and they, they'd already contacted us and said, we want you to be in it. You're welcome to write anything you want. So there's me, John Thompson, uh, Caroline, we all meet, uh, Mark Williams, and, and the whole cast, and, you know... And we're reading the script and there's Ralph and Ted there. And I, and I go, oh, can me and John do this? And they're like, no, we're doing that. And, you know, well, I, my stuff was notorious, always, always written on bits of, sort of paper and pencil. And, and, and But it was very competitive. You know, you come up with an idea. Right. Like, like Mark's I'll get my coat thing. He was always coming up and going, what about this? And we'd all, and you know, it was because me and Paul was, sort of, me and Paul was sort of London and bloking and, you know, with pubs and, you know, sly, and then you got John, who was younger and was from up north. You forget that the two of the people from up north that was also what made it good. And then Mark was 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 Birmingham, but but Cambridge educated and a proper actor and very bright. I mean, scarily bright. You know, you one of the people you drive around, he starts telling you all the architecture, what the you know where they yeah. did and all that. But he was always, you know, he was always he cut and we'd go, and Charlie would go, "What's the joke?" And all that. It was a quite. It was a bit like a sort of bear pit. You know what I mean? Did you write things, Dave no, Angel? Quite... Did you write Dave Angel Eco Warrior, uh, or was that cast for you to play? No, I wrote that. Yeah, I based that. Can you remember I... trying it out on them for the first time? I don't remember that. I basically read Mike Reed's book. I'm obsessed with. You know, a lot of comedians got obsessed with reading sort of old showbiz uh, biographies. You know, because they're sort of so interesting. I mean, Danny Baker's probably the man for him. And I, I went to Danny. What's the best one, Danny? He went probably. Yeah, he'll give you five. But uh, I read Mike Reed's and it just it was just so odd. It was just very funny. And I just found it so, you know, he claims Mike Reed when he was sort of 20, he went and worked at a sort of big warehouse and they had a rat problem and they couldn't get rid of them. And he, and he claims he ki- he bit through their necks and killed all the rats <laughs> in, over the weekend. So that's one of the stories in it. Another story is, you know, it, and it just it was so funny. What up and all that. And I just thought. You know, I like those sort of people. I find them funny and interesting. And I went, to, you know, I went to a comprehensive school, and the dads would turn up, and they go, "All right, mate," and they give their kids. And I was like, "Why? My dad's really sort of public school, and he he would, you know, it, it, he was so different and less fun. I suppose that's what it is. But right. you always see that your own parents, you compare them, don't you? And they go, "Hello, mate, give us a tinkle," you know. And and uh, and uh, I just thought, what what would my, you know, what would this character be? Be not interested. I thought global warming. It's just it's that you juxtapose something ridiculous. The fact that there's no way that bloke would be remotely interested in global warming, or even know what it was. And um, <laughs> that yeah, and, and it just sort of I took. I don't know why, and I, I should have done a sitcom with it because it's just everyone just the walk, and, and it's like how can that? When well, I did it live, you do the walk, and then and then you do the material. It's almost like hey, I don't know why. I don't know why. It was but I didn't plan. You know. Uh, Paul would go. Paul and Charlie are very good at knowing what is funny and what isn't. So they say, "Do the walk again," and get. And they would come up and make me have a catchphrase, and they say, "You must have a catchphrase, Simon." And I go, "And I don't want a catchphrase. You know, I would try and be different." You know? <laughs> and Paul and Charlie would go, "Well, even James Bond's got a catchphrase." And like, yeah, he, this he, is a catchphrase much, show. <laughs> yeah, yeah totally. exactly. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's the thing with Charlie. He's and like with with a uh, monkfish, he, he came up with "Put your niggers on" and you know, make me a cup of tea. Well, I, that was in the script. He said, "What about that?" Monkfish like, is genius. That's absolute genius. Though. Yeah, I just got sick of all those BBC One shows. I remember it, it's from yeah. Heartbeat, you know, and suddenly. He's in heartbeat, and then he did a thing where he went down. And he was he worked as a harbour master, didn't he? And, and it's that thing: get a nice environment, get a young star, get a thing, you know, put it on ten million viewers. Those things lazy, you know. When you yeah. growing up watching Edge of Darkness and you know Alan Bleasdale and all this stuff, I just I found that really depressing the way it switched to that world of just those terrible shows that were just you know. I suppose you know they're, they're the same for everyone. You realise that now, but. Uh, it's wait. funny about your showbiz memoirs, though, uh, that uh, I have to think with showbiz memoirs, it's, it's similar to rock memoirs, actually. Yeah. You can either read them as tragedy or comedy. Yeah. You know, depending on how, 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 you, how you're adjusting yourself. If you read Ronnie Wood's autobiography, it's told as if, well, yeah, then yeah, we had a right it, yeah. laugh about this. Yeah. But you think, if you read that with another head on, you think, this is the saddest story I've ever read in Jesus, my life. Terrible misfortune, isn't it? <laughs> the water yes. is, yeah. <laughs> And then the house went on fire. Yeah. <laughs> and no, no, all, no, no, how we laughed about it. Yeah. Uh, he, um, 
he Paul <laughs> yeah I mean, I've met I met Ronnie Wood and Jimmy White when they were drinking in a restaurant in Notting Hill at lunchtime and they had carrier bags of cans on them and they were so charming and he looked about five stone but yeah <laughs> Paul's, Paul loves the 70s. He's obsessed with the 70s. And right, he said, he used it character calls. If this was the 70s, we'd be able to walk down the road and say, hello, darling. You know, I've read all of them. And what I find interesting is reading the different band members. I've just read, I've just read the drama from Talking Heads biography. Oh, Chris Francis, right. great. Yeah. It's great book. It's the first ever take on, you hear these things about David Byrne and it's like, wow. But I don't, and part of me is like, I don't really want to know because he was just a godlike person to me, you know. Yeah. There's a lovely bit where he invites David Byrne around to meet his parents. Do you remember that? <laughs> I and know. Lunch. And David Byrne does this ridiculous thing where he rolls the peas off a knife into his mouth <laughs> just to be kind of eccentric. And his parents go, well, and, and they're uh, very, uh, very uh, posh, aren't they? Or the, the, the France setup is incredibly posh. I think posh. they are, yeah. I think they're yeah. quite, he's quite, quite, uh, uh, they're all very bright, aren't they? they all make it, yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, also, I've just finished read Roger Daltrey's, and, you, and you, I read Pete Townsend's, which was really interesting. And I sort of, because I, I was a big, always a big fan of, of the Who, massive fan of the Who. And and, and then yeah, I read Roger Daltrey's recently, and you kind of get the different sides of the story: how much more insecure he was, and how difficult it was for him. And I didn't realise all that they hated, you know, they wanted him out of the band. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, there was you know, an episode in Dave, Dave's account of it, one of your books, Dave, where, where Roger goes was, and lives in his car. Doesn't he sleep in his car or the van? Well, he, his wife, his from... wife has chugged him out or something like that. And I think, yeah. he, I think he's even working for his wife's father. Or something. It's, it's yeah. really complicated. And he right. lived in a van. He lived in the van while waiting to be chucked out of the group. Yeah. Then they let him back in. And this yeah. is just before kind of the breakthrough, you know, I know. 65 or whatever. It's I mean, extraordinary. Yeah. Quadrophenia. Some, some, I was listening to Quadrophenia the other day, the, sonically, on a CD. I mean, that's an incredible, that's an incredible album, really. I mean, they, they had higher, they had higher potentials, didn't they? they? They all went from R and B and blues, and, they, and then they started playing with classical, classical, you know, stuff, didn't they? John Lord's classical, whatever. Um, <laughs> yes. so I'm, I'm rambling. Sound something, yeah. you know, John. No, Lord's it probably didn't sound album. quite as good on your little Phillips portable. No, it didn't sound so good on that. I don't have more than a cassette either. <laughs> I think I think my brother said I yeah I don't think I bought any more cassettes. No. But, uh, yeah, I, I obviously you know um, yeah just music uh, you know I suppose I wanted to be in a band but then you know I found them also ridiculous. You know, then you, you sort of listen to Led Zeppelin now you listen to the lyrics I mean lyrically Led Zeppelin what I mean how do they get away with it? Oh it's, absolutely, oh, it's astonishing. It's astonishing. Yeah, isn't it? songs like Jamaica. I mean it's ridiculous, isn't it? When you think about it now. <laughs> Well, have you ever envied? I find it very hard to envy rock stars, actually, because I think, well, that's they're in this predicament where they've got to kind of sustain this career. But is there any rock star you've ever looked at and thought, that's the life I'd like? Um, well, David, you know, David Byrne, I suppose, was because was, uh, he was mm. so he was so he was just so cool, wasn't he? And, and but then you realize, like, I remember seeing him interviewed on something once, I think it was the Ogre Whistle Test, and he'd gone to some ridiculous place, some weir probably somewhere in the middle of America with all this weird modernist architecture. You couldn't hear a thing. You'd obviously go, no, we're going to go here. It, it, you know, it takes, you've got to work hard at it. You know what I mean? To be odd, haven't you? And to be. But, yes, that's a very good point. You yeah, know, it's got to be a real effort to be eccentric. Or being too normal. Isn't yeah. Like? I mean, the records are just, the, the, you know, remaining light and, 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 uh, oh God, I've got the name of it. And fear of music for me, those fear two records, the way they sound, everything about them. Are just just incredible. Do you know what I mean? To me personally, you know, because I don't, I don't particularly the way they fuse everything. Um, yeah, I, I mean, Romanian Light is obviously everyone's favourite. A lot of comedians like talking heads because they're sort of clever, aren't they? Comedians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, have that's. You got the, have you got any more stuff there to show us? You know what? I, don't, I, I, I just don't. I've got. What have I okay, got? Okay, don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. No, I, I, you got I, you, yeah. plug your book. Have you got your book there? You I've got, got my book. Yes. Yeah. When did your book come out? My book came out. It came out about five, six years ago, because I can remember you at the Larn Festival reading an extract from it. It was very, very funny. No, it came out long before that. It came out in, sort of, I'll, I'll tell you, it was a long time ago. It was 2000 and, 2011. No, that's right. No, it was and, and, uh, right. You know, they gave me a bit of an advance. It was just, just the whole publishing industry was falling apart. I yeah, think you got told, there. <laughs> they said we're going to get a Russell Brand sort of type book and they could have, but, but uh you know it was just the, the guy simon schuster goes oh i turned down this and i turned down him and i turned to him but i really like you and blah blah 
and uh, I had all the stories there, and and it's it's now sort of seven hundred and thirty eight quid on Amazon or something. You know, they only makes because they only makes print so many, don't they? <laughs> and and so, so it's like, but it's really good word of mouth. Uh, people who read it love it. It's it's it's. I mean, I have sort of made 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 light. It's a bit like like Kit, like Ronnie Wood. I made light over over certain situations where you could go bloody hell. Chris uh, Chris Chris um, Tarrant went to me. Read your book. Most depressing thing I've ever read in my life. He said, <laughs> because I couldn't write one. I upset too many people. And he said, well, he walked off. And I, and, and I wish I loved. But um, <laughs> other people just think it's the most funniest book they've ever read. They they literally they just think it's very funny, you know. But it it's I kind of wanted to write. What does it take to make a comedian? Because I, you get all these comedians' books. They go, it's all great, it's lovely and brilliant. And it's not, you know, comedian comedy is a weird world. It's very competitive. If you haven't got sort of issues with with your parents, it, it, you know, all those all those American comedians on, on <laughs> the nine eight percent of American comedians that not like you read them up. They were they were army kids always. They always say oh, I was an army brat because you know they're moving around. They can't make friends. Yeah. They're weird. They they want to try and impress people. That or they develop their own. I just wanted to show what it's like, how much sort of... Um, it's so true, because happy happy environments don't seem to produce great comedy, do they, in later No, on. exactly. Why would you want to go on a stage and say, love me? You know, why, why, you know and yeah. I often think, I want to, you know, people go, God, must be amazing. I go, no, I'd rather be one of those people that, you know, I sort of admire those. It's a bit like the bit in a Magnificent Seven when a kid goes, you know, to, to, to Charles Bronson, I want to be like you. He goes, no, being a man is having a family. And, you know, I always see those people and they've just got a nice house. They earn sort of 30 grand a year. They have one one bottle of beer, and they go. No, I don't need that. I don't need this. And I'm one of those. You know what I mean? It's about. Uh, I don't know. It's it's that whole thing of. I think for a while I believed in the whole. You know, all my heroes. They all. You know, were Hancock, the ones that died, Peter Cook, and all that. And again, it's tragic. All that. It's just you know, they were all didn't have rehab, did they? And 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 I think it's it's, it's crazy how you know the best ones all seem to sort of just die off um not, not all of them but yeah i believe that you i think i believed oh you know if you make people laugh you have to be have to be sort of sad yourself i don't know but I, not strictly true it's like saying oh david bowie's records were all best when he's on drugs it's not true is it you know most it, it, you know, art is art and if you're if you're clean and sober you're probably going to make a better job of it yeah you know, i was sort of found out was like you sort of find out wayne coin doesn't take drugs and you go really do you know what i mean but in fact that's why they're so productive and they're such a good band. Do you know what I mean? It's like you read about all these 70s bands, you read the books and you think, how the hell? The gigs must have been terrible. And they're all <laughs> off their nuts on different things. They can't even in the time. There's like 100,000 people in some stadium in Detroit. People go, oh, that weren't very good. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I don't know, I'm drifting. I've gone, I've, I've gone off piste. But um, <laughs> what was the question? No, don't do what, what, what's he calling it? It's comedy and errors. Uh, it's comedy, comedy and error. errors. They really were the marvellous time. times. That's it, yeah. Oh, yeah, the really was marvelous times. I mean, maybe they're going to have to do a reprint. Oh, look, it's the wrong way around. Um, <laughs> but it is, it, you know, it's, 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 I'm very proud of it because, uh, as they spoke on Twitter, oh, I never realized he had a life like that, you know, because I was in Bolstal for a year and stuff due to right. addiction. And that was very interesting, actually. Just quickly said, when I was in Bolstal, it was 1981, which for me is the best year of music ever. And right. we'd all go up and watch uh, Top of the Pops on Saturday morning. And uh, the black and white riots were going on outside. It was crazy. And, and you know, you, and you had Ghost Town, you had Once in a Lifetime, all these crazy records. You know, and there was this, and I remember this massive argument once when Ghost Town was number one. And this, this white guy, the white daddy was going, it's a white man singing, you know, isn't it? And they were going, it's all music. You know, it was, it was crazy. It was, a, it's a, that's an interesting subject. Music while you're in prison, while, you, while you're, 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 you're in a, under lock and key. <laughs> There's certain records I hear them now and they remind me. Like I said, I met Carl from Madness and embarrassment was was out when I was sort of in. I was like, oh god, you're an embarrassment. And, and you know, you sort of think it's about you. And certain records lately was out as well. God, did I hate that record? Mirror. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is worst ever record anyway, wasn't it? it? Has to be his worst ever record. Um that's a, that's a good idea for a book. Yeah. Music, <laughs> music no, inside. Because I, know, I had my little radio. Nobody's done that. I had it. I had my little radio. I listened to John Peel at night in bed, and my mum used to send me the enemy, and I listened to John Peel. In in and I was at an open ball store. You know, we had it wasn't you know, 
Trying it's, to not, it's not like the film. What was on Peel at that time? That teardrop explodes, stuff like that? Oh, yeah, I love them. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I preferred them to Echo and the Bunnymen, who I thought were, uh, well, but it's been accepted they're a better band. I, the first Teardrop Explodes album I thought was brilliant. And um, the second one, it kind of a bit odd. It goes off on tangents, doesn't it? But, they, 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 you know, they, they, yeah, love them. Echo, Teardrop Explodes, Comedians. Um, I'm trying to think who else was around at that time, but there there was a lot of good... The the top of the pops of 1981 is so eclectic. You've got all that soul music coming in, Uh, dance music, disco, and, you know, Ghost Town and and, uh, Once in a Lifetime, which is considered to be the two greatest records of my sort of generation, aren't they, really? So we we traditionally traditionally finish these chats by asking people, what's the greatest record ever made? Is that something you have a view on? Yes, I've been thinking about this, and I'm going to go, and I don't think this is the greatest record I've ever made. I mean, you know, I'm torn between New Boots and Panties. Obviously, uh, the Beatles were the greatest record I've ever made in terms of, you know, how far thinking they were and what, how they changed everything, blah, blah. My personal favourite is Asia by Steve Dan. All right. All right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I was totally obsessed with Steve Dan. Like, having not got into them and suddenly heard them late on, Around the time I started doing comedy, and then I just started listening to them, and, and they sort of those sort of they were like short stories, that sort of hipster world of sort of you know, it's like, and I think it's the combination of the music. I'm not into jazz music. I'm not into that sort of the sort of tightness of the music and his sort of humanity of his voice. And they were just yeah. very clever, weren't they? And odd and weird, and all those words and names. And oh, all the words! I, don't know about the words. I can one. still remember words like the squonk. Skeevy, meringue. I can remember. McCann. That's right. Just yeah. r- random words. It was a real education listening to them. Yeah. There's a what wonderful is a squonk, web, you know. There's a, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, you can look it up in the, it's a a Steely Dan Dictionary. Wonderful website called the Steely Dan Dictionary. Yeah. Where a I'll fan has gone through every single, you know, reference to an item in a Steely Dan song, either a place or a Right, drink or or whatever, and explains the derivation. Explain, and they've all got a story. They've all got. A, it's yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I don't know if I want to read that. Because in any major dude uh, has got uh, mentions the word squonk, and I looked it up, and it's a mythical creature. I love that. You know, I love that idea that nobody yeah, else would bother. You know, I know me, extraordinary. You know, bodacious but, cowboys such as your friends would never be welcome here, and uh, the Asia. But, the Asia are classic albums is my favourite as well. Me and John Thompson watch it because John Thompson's massively into jazz funk and he's a drummer and all that right. album's great. They have all yeah, these, yeah. these session musicians and they're all so and they obviously didn't enjoy a lot of it. And then one guy just goes, "Oh yeah, different world. No fart. The great thing, no fart jokes. You know what I mean? In the studio, <laughs> yeah. it's like." And, and I don't know, how could they afford to do it and then to throw it all away? I mean, I've read it all up about how this, you know, Gaucho and they lost. Well, they sold there. so many records when they yeah. when they came out, I suppose, yeah. in those days. It yeah. was, a, you know, it was big sales. Yeah. So what are you, what, what, so you're, you're, you're back, um, you know, you're making this series where you play the pub ra- landlord. No, I finished that. that started the, I'm now, I'm about to start that, filming uh, a BBC One sitcom called, Oh, I'm allowed, no, I'm allowed to say. No, I can't say that. Oh, okay. Don't worry. When's the pub landlord thing out? It's already out. It's called Pennyworth, and you've got to pay. Oh, it's coming out. It's coming out there. Yeah. There's yeah. two seasons, and you've got to buy some channel to buy it. Epic. Yeah. Or it is yeah. quite. I have to say, my son liked it. He doesn't like anything. It's uh, you know, it's from a comic, so they can basically put anything in it. You know, it's yeah. got Queen in it. It's got. It's really bizarre. Um, and uh, it was fantastic to film it and be on those American. I've never done any of that big time American filming where they have not only a canteen but a wagon where you can get any oh, yeah. coffee and any kind oh, of, sort of juice at the same time. Have, we did film it. some in COVID times though that wasn't as much fun. We had to do an hour and a half. We had an hour and a half Zoom call, which we all had to go on with with Warner's Brothers America with all these vice presidents and they're all attractive women. There's about, there's loads of them, you know, because it's film, right? And they would just start telling us all off and saying, we find in America that 60% of people that go into restaurants catch COVID and like trying to be basically saying, don't, you know, because oh, really? basically we got into, I just say what you're saying, oh, here are the, here are the rules for filming Penny with, and you've got to isolate. And I rang my mate and I went, this is a bit strong, isn't it? And he said, no, he said, because someone gave it to so-and-so and they had to shut down Batman, you know, and it's like yeah. to them, this is it. we all Absolutely. know it's all this run by it. money now. It's so much 
It's money. all insurance, isn't it? Yeah. The insurers will only will only pay up or you know cover them if they say we're going to get all the actors on a Zoom call and we're going to lecture them. Yeah. You know, that'll probably be. It will be part of the uh, stipulations behind this. You know. God, I don't know how they're. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, oh. it's, it, it's great. And I, I, I'm lucky to do this job. I'm lucky to still to still be here and still be working. And I uh, know, you know, uh, I, I was funny enough, Reece, one of our things we watched over there was Live, was live Aid, because Reese just gets everything of a full <laughs> transmission, which you did, you both did, or you did, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, no, we both did, yeah, yeah. We both we did, both, I remember yeah. it. Dave did the, the, the bit with Bob Geldof, the swearing moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, remember, I remember the bit I remember was, was, was Andrew Ridgely and, 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 and Billy Connolly. And Billy Connolly's going and pointing and all that, and Andrew just stone faced him out. But uh, yeah, I watched that. I watched the live live aid with a load of um, jazz fusion people who were really embarrassed by it. And me and my mate were like, "You're joking, aren't you?" We we loved all of it, not all of it, but some people were incredible. Some of the some of the talent on there, but obviously Queen, you know, Jesus. Yeah. Well, Fred, you know, that was some of I'm not a Queen yeah. fan, but but Reese is obsessed with Queen. Um, you should get Reese on; he'd be good. Or Paul Whitehouse, I mean, but Reese would be good to get on because he's a. Uh... Do you know Reese Thomas? What is the is the only person to he went on he went on Celebrity Mastermind dressed as Freddie Mercury in the Harlequin out, outfit, and then got a full score, which no one's ever done on Queen. <laughs> and Brian May gave him a guitar. It would have been embarrassing to go on dressed as him and do really yes, bad. Yes, do bad. Right, right. <laughs> would have really fallen really flat would. in his face there because it kind of yeah. implies that you know what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> Pass. Pass. Oh. Yeah, oh, well, look, it's been so lovely been, to talk to you. It's fantastic. Yeah, I know, it's, been, it's, been great. it's been lovely to talk to you, and um, and all the very best. Yeah, thank have you a nice you day, guys. and um, and you know, we we might even see you in physical space when this whole bloody war is over, as we say. Yeah, it just seems like a war, doesn't it? When you look at the photos, <laughs> it does. It does. It does. Anyway, you love you guys. Thanks very much. Great. Word in your attic. A Zoom with a View.